dear friend thank you for joining me today uh still in lockdown it's been two weeks and uh, today's video actually has been provoked by a couple of videos that i've recently seen on social media and i just want to address a few things from my point of view um i recently watched a video of pope francis that had been altered so a video that he had made to be shared with uh, other christian brothers and sisters and i think it was shown in a pentecostal uh, church in america but that video was kind of altered so the message the actual message of the pope was altered and what i found really really sad and regretful is why people would do that and obviously i have heard or i kind of read on the internet that it was done by people with uh, an anti-religious group that wants to to just portray the pope as satan but also um i have heard people from other christian denominations make a derogatory statements about the pope which i just think it's not fair and it is quite unkind. However, it also reminds me truly that when someone is really faithful to God, they will be persecuted. And the highest person who underwent such persecution is none other but Christ himself. Um, it also just reminded me viewing that video so many things that I've heard over the years growing up right to this day about the Catholic Church. And I just want to address a few of those things without malice, really, uh, because it's just too much. And sometimes you just question why, why leave the Catholic Church alone? You know, um, growing up, I heard things like we worship Mary. And I want to say now, no, we don't. We do not worship Mary. And having said that, I will say, I always have my rosary. Where is it? When we recite the Hail Mary, whenever we say the rosary, the first couple of lines are biblical. The angel's greeting and Elizabeth's greeting. And we always start with Hail Mary, full of grace. The Lord is with thee. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. The second part of that prayer, which says, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. That is the prayer. And I've heard people criticize that one, we call her the Mother of God, which me, which is blasphemous because she cannot be the mother of God, the creator. And in response to that, I will say, if we say that we have got the father, got the son and got the Holy Ghost or got the Holy Spirit, she is the mother of God, the son. So what is wrong with referring to her as mother of God? If we already know that the God we are referring to in our prayer is Jesus. I will leave that part there. And this prayer is not as if we're praying to Mary, who is our God. She is not our God. We have our God Almighty, who is our creator and our maker. We cannot confuse both. We intercede through her. Someone once told me, God said that in the Bible, it says you should pray only to God. Come on now. We believe in the communion of saints. The angels and saints in heaven can pray. They can join you and pray to God to help you. There's another criticism of the Catholic Church. We pray for the dead. That once someone is dead, that's it about them. I want to make it really clear. We, we, we might have to agree to disagree sometimes. The Catholic Church has got seven additional books that other Protestant churches don't have. So I will not go into the detail of why the Catholic Church has these seven books and why the Protestant Bibles don't have those seven books. 
And I think one of the seven books that the Protestant churches don't have is the book of Maccabees. And in the second book of Maccabees, specifically, I think it's chapter, chapter 12 from verse 38, you will actually see a certain Judas who prays for the dead because he believes in praying for the dead. He believes in the resurrection of the dead. I will not dwell too much on that again. I'm going to move on to other criticisms, Critic criticisms like we, we worship idols. No, thank you. We don't. We don't. We may have our little crucifixes and effigies that are blessed and that we keep in our homes, but we don't worship them. They're just a symbol. I will give you a simple example. When you have um, a picture of a loved one, for example, I'm just giving you a simple example. It might not be the best example to give, but that's just what came to my mind. If you have a picture of a loved one and they pass on from this life, and from time to time, you look at it and it reminds you of that person and you hold it close, your, close to your heart. Does it mean you're holding that person close to your heart? No. Does it mean anything you're saying, you're saying to that picture? No. It just reminds you of who that person was. So if I have a crucifix or a cross that has been carved with the symbol of Christ, if I'm looking at it, it's not as if I'm praying to that cross. No. It is a symbol of what it signifies to me. It reminds me of Christ. It reminds me of his passion. I'm not going to keep going because I want to just touch on these very briefly. I will move on to even Lent, the period of Lent. I've heard people question why we celebrate Lent, why we go through the period of Lent, mourning for Christ who had already died and risen and that we should be celebrating his life. My question to that in return is why do we celebrate Christmas? It is not prescribed in any Bible that we should celebrate Christmas. It is not prescribed in any Bible that Lent should be done in a particular way. All of these things are practices to remember Christ because as Catholics and as Christians, we are followers of Christ and anything to remind us of his life. At Christmas, any celebration to remind us of his birth. During Lent, Anything to remind us of what he went through for us, for our salvation. There are other critis criticisms that I've heard over the years. And rightly so, because the Catholic Church is not perfect. I will put my hand up and say, yes, we're not perfect. It is made of human beings like you and I, who sin every day. And we have to keep praying for repentance and for purification. Criticisms of priests and all sorts of stories about priests. I will put my hand up and say, yes, our priests have made mistakes over the years. But no one thinks about the percentage that is actually doing its best. The percentage of priests that do a lot of good. The percentage of priests that try to live their lives in a Christ-like manner. But that little percentage that makes a mistake, everyone plunges and focuses just on that one even as i speak about priests you know we've heard about priests the suggestion that priests should marry yes it's an idea but if the church has decided it doesn't want to there's a reason for it i think it's not until the 12th century actually that that we started that the the church decided that priests should not marry because rome let's not forget Rome is the center of the Catholic and Christian faith. That's where it all started. That is where the seat of Peter is, St. Peter. He was the first Pope of the Catholic Church. And yes, practices may have changed over the years. Yes, they have been mafia. And I've heard all sorts of things. I'm not uh, an expert in all of these. But what I'm trying to say is, yes, the church is not perfect. But when people want to share videos and share their criticism of the church, they should try to be objective. When I look at the criticism of the Pope, their latest video even incited the Pope in the video that was altered was actually saying how he has convinced all of us Catholic worshippers to worship him. 
And when, once I saw that video, I just shook my head. I said, even if it was true, even if I believed that Pope Francis was saying that, I would laugh at that video. Who is he to be worshipped? Who is he? What kind of miracles has he even performed for me to want to even be convinced that he could be worshipped? When in the Bible we had prophets who performed miracles and were not worshipped. Why would anyone think that the Pope can get us to worship him? No way. He's only a representative, a leader. And it just saddens me sometimes to see how people have their own agendas. And sometimes it is to beat themselves up. Okay, they have personal agendas. Sometimes maybe to just increase their own profile, attract more worshippers into their churches. I don't know. I have a lot of friends in the Protestant churches and uh, Pentecostal churches. I have a lot of close friends who are pastors. And we agree, we agree that the one thing that unites us definitely is Christ. We worship the one true God and let no one be convinced of anything else. All of these videos I see on social media, I want to talk to you, particularly my Catholic brothers and sisters. Do not be deterred in your faith for any reason. And the reason why Catholics are very gullible to these criticisms, I have to face it, is we don't even know our Bible. We don't study the word. And so any silly video that goes viral, that criticizes our faith, because we don't even know what we're doing sometimes, we become gullible and we drift away. So with COVID-19, I've heard all sorts of things. I've even heard that the Pope is a, a devil and he is one of the people who is getting together with leaders of the world to connive and whatever it is like really guys we have to focus on christ even those delivering those videos there's a certain pastor joe in america who is convinced that the pope is trying to to lead people into the one world religion that was revealed in in revelations and he's saying all sorts of even the way he was speaking without humility without love as if he wanted to score points i just want to say we should beware of the things that we watch on social media we should just beware we should beware the things we say i wouldn't criticize first of all i want to say no church is even perfect no church is perfect be it even our catholic church at the moment is the best church for me right now but I cannot claim that it's perfect. The Pentecostal churches, I can find flaws in there. Protestant churches, everywhere. There are flaws everywhere. But Christ said he is the light of the world. Christ said, do not touch my anointed. With this, I'm referring to the Pope. Christ says we should follow him, worship him, love him, love one another. If we focus on this, we'll have very little time to be thinking about criticizing one another. We will be thinking more about what, what we have in common. And I do not see why the Pope wanting us to call each other as brothers and sisters with our brothers and sisters of other Christian denominations is becoming a big hoo-ha. He is a man of God. I'm not saying he's perfect. But please leave him alone. Just leave him alone. We need to pray for the church. We need to pray for Christians. We need to pray for Christian unity. But if there are any Christians who don't want to pray for Christian unity, that is fine. Don't go along spreading rumors, trying to criticize. It wouldn't lead us anywhere. And what I want to say is we need to pray. We need to pray for our priests. We need to pray for our Pope. We need to pray for our pastors in all of these other Christian churches. We need to pray for Christians all over the world. We need to pray for, for human beings in other denominations, the Muslims. And as I speak, there isn't division just in the Christian faith. 
even the Muslims, they have their own divisions. For instance, when you go to, to the Muslim faith, you'll notice that they, I think they call them the Shias and the Sui's. I, I can't even remember. Shia, Sunni, they too have differences, but they believe in Allah. Can we just put these differences aside and focus on our personal journey? Salvation is personal. No one has ever died and come back to say, oh, this is how death is. This is how life after death is. We can only believe in what we believe, okay? What we read in scripture, what we understand from scripture. I think there was something here I wanted to talk about Mary because there was something about us praying to Mary, worshiping Mary. How do we even know that Mary rose from the dead because it's not in the Bible? Catholics have this Bible. Secondly, their Bible has these seven books that other Pentecostal churches don't have or Protestant churches. And also we believe in tradition and tradition is passed on, passed on from the time of Christ through St. Peter, who was the first Pope, through the various Popes. And why we believe, there's a belief that Mary went to heaven. And I know, sorry, I'm having a cramp, so I'm having to move a little bit. So, um, oh dear, sorry. So there has been a question about how do we know that um, Mary is in heaven? And there are so many instances, one of them really, let me just see if I can remember where I found that quote. I know that um, in Hebrew 11.5 and in 2 Kings 2.11, we hear about Enoch and Elijah being assumed to heaven. I think about, um, how do we call it, the transfiguration when... Who was it? Elijah and who was it? They appeared to, to Christ. And then I think about Matthew 27, where it says the saints whose bodies left the grave after Christ's resurrection. In fact, let me read that. It said, um, this is from verse 51. It said, then the curtain hanging in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook. This was after the death of Christ. The earth shook. The rocks split apart. The graves broke open and many of God's people who had died were raised to life. And so when we move on to the New Testament, Romans 8, 17 tells us that those who suffer with Christ will be glorified with him. When you read this, who was Christ's? closest person when you read his life history in the bible there was no one whose relationship was as close as that of his and his mother i know he had disciples that he loved so much like peter james and john but the kind of relationship he had with with his mother and the way the mother was portrayed right from the beginning the virgin who conceived of the holy spirit you know and who who bore the son of god in her womb how can we imagine that all of these saints and these good people rose from the dead were taken into heaven and she wouldn't be sometimes it's common sense yes it may not be in the Bible right there, but we have other scriptures to support this. And you don't have to believe it. You don't have to believe it. Sometimes the spirit might speak to you in a different way and you might discern certain messages in a different way. But please, what is not so nice is when people become too mean and deliberately try to say negative things when they have no proof and no evidence. And what is not nice as well, is that I know that deep down, some of these pastors, like uh, I'm going to mention the two, I think I've mentioned their names already, uh, Kenneth Copeland, in whose church this video was viewed, <coughs> excuse me, and Joe Ikuchuku, somebody like that, he had another video in which he was really criticizing the Pope. I want to come from a place of love because that's what Christ would do. They persecuted Christ in front of the high priest. 
remained silent, remained silent when he was being persecuted. Perhaps that should be the response of the Pope and of the Catholic Church. When you're being persecuted, remain silent. We can even see that Christ always reacted with love whenever he was persecuted or whenever negative things were said or done. He always came from a place of love. When he was talking to the woman at the well, he was coming from a place of love. When the prostitute who was about to be stoned was brought to him because she had committed adultery, Christ came from a place of love. When those who were brought by Judas to arrest Jesus arrived and someone cut his ear. I think, uh, no, 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 someone, I think it was Peter who cut the ear of one of the soldiers who had come. He came from a place of love. He picked up that ear and put it back in. What is Christ teaching us? When faced with adversity, let's approach it with love. Let's unite our pain with that of Christ. And the reason why I want to conclude with uniting our pain with Christ is that the reason I'm sharing this video with you and showing compassion and love and understanding, even though I am upset about all of these things I see, is that until and unless you've gone through a personal journey in which you have experienced pain, disappointment, persecution, you may not understand. What the world needs is love. We don't need all of these criticisms, all of these silly things that people go around doing. And with COVID-19 now, we have a bigger problem on our hands. We need to pray for Christian unity. We need to pray for peace in the world. The world had drifted so much away from Christ and the devil is having the last laugh. He has a sneaky, excuse me, he has a sneaky and conniving way of, subtle way of going about things. And what he's doing now is getting Christians to fight against Christians, to say negative things about one another so there can be conflict and causing confusion. And the word tells us in times of confusion, why are you scared? Why are you frustrated? We shouldn't be, we should be calm, have faith, have hope, pray, and hope for the better. I was mentioning the rosary before, before I conclude, in fact, I just wanted to mention one which I don't know if many people are aware of. A lot of Catholics also use this rosary. It is one that we call the Thank You Jesus Rosary with 250 bits. And all you do on this is you say Thank You Jesus on each bit. So if you do not have it, try and find a way if you can count your fingers, because sometimes we say a thousand times. You want to tell someone how many times you're saying thank you to them. What about Jesus? So we do have one, a thank you, Jesus, was bit, where on each bit, you just say thank you, Jesus. You thank him for your pain, for your suffering, for anything you're going through. During this COVID-19, we pray for all the victims and all those who have lost uh, loved ones to the virus in the hope that the Lord will open our eyes to see the positive that can come out of this. I pray actually uh, for all church leaders, leaders in the Catholic Church, leaders in Pentecostal churches, leaders in Protestant churches, leaders of all faiths and religions really, that they can continue to see God as the one true creator who is love and that hate cannot override. The enemy can never really win. God is love. God is the almighty. God is the creator. He is the beginning and the end. He's our deliverer, the merciful one. Nobody is perfect. We've all fallen short of the glory of God and we need to focus on Christ and all of these pains and troubles. Let's reunite them to Christ's pain on the cross. Because that is the only thing that would reassure our salvation by his death and his wounds. We are healed and we are saved. I thank you so much. I apologize for taking too long on this. But I just wanted to touch on a series of different, different things that have been a little concern and worry for me. 
one more thing really i think there's something i wanted to say here okay no i think i've said everything i wanted to to share and i'll end by just saying god is watching god is watching whatever you're doing in the secret of your room of your house or those of you who are very active on social media just be careful what you share out there try and be more positive and encourage people don't share hate don't incite people to think bad and negatively about anything god bless you all thank you so much and i apologize for making it this longer than i really wanted to and so yes please if you have not yet subscribed please 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 on youtube click the subscribe button do like do share and god bless you oh it's palm sunday today i didn't want to do a palm sunday reflection but i must end by saying it's been really sad to experience a first palm sunday without going to a congregation my family and i we had to watch uh the mass live on tv uh, via facebook really and we just need to continue praying for this situation to end so that we can continue to meet our fellow Christians and people in our communities. Okay, God bless and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye.